So our final speaker for today will be Mr. Fish with his talk titled Raising Your Cannon, the, uh, a reflection on the admirable work of an unsung revolutionary hero. Mr. Fish. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit today about in my study of history, um, which is something I like to study and have, be, have enjoyed studying more and more as I've gotten older. Um, the reflections of one particular person, and as I've also mixed that with some of my understanding about achievement and about success and about leadership. Um, so today we're going to be looking at a formula that I've come to think about in my own mind. And, it, and it, there's a lot of people that um, I have to thank for helping with this formula. But this formula is something that I'm going to sort of leave you with as our day uh, and our little bit of time together progresses. But the story begins in Boston in 1775, after the Battle of Lexington and Concord, we had a situation. Shots had been fired against the revolutionaries and the British troops. Um, there was a bit of tension in the air, to say the least. The British were occupying Boston, and George Washington and his ragtag group of Revolutionaries had them surrounded and were trying to cut off them getting resupplies of food and other things. And it had gone on like this for months. And it looked like this thing is going nowhere. And George Washington needed something. He needed something to break it free. And so who he talked to was someone who had become a good friend of his, um, this man, Henry Knox. Now, does anybody know the story of Henry Knox? Anyone sort of a little bit? So Henry Knox was this guy, right? Henry Knox was not a <laughs> military general. When you look at Henry Knox, he's, he doesn't bowl you over with his chiseled brow or his muscular stature, right? Henry Knox was not the most impressive looking guy in the world. Henry Knox was 25 years old in 1775. He was the owner of a small bookshop. And in my research for this talk, actually what I discovered was that Knox was actually had joined a gang when he was like 15, 16 years old and was known for his ability to conduct a street fight. Right? Knox was actually quite a good street fighter, but he ended up, through all kinds of circumstance, owning this bookshop where he got to talk with people, military people, etc. And he became quite a, a person who studied military tactics, particularly artillery. So at 25, Henry Knox goes to George Washington. The two of them had become friends throughout this early part of the revolution. He says, look, you need some cannons. And George Washington says, absolutely, I need some cannons. He says, well, I know where I can get you some cannons. He says, where? I, I definitely need them. He says, well, the only problem is these cannons are located at Fort Ticonderoga. Now, Fort Ticonderoga is 300 miles away from Boston, through mountains, across rivers, past Lake George. It's not an easy trek, and it's getting cold out. And so Henry Knox says, look, give me a couple weeks. I'll take a bunch of people. We'll go get these 120,000 pounds of cannons, and we'll drag them back here for you. It's going to snow soon. We'll get some sleds. We'll just pull them with some oxen. It's not a big deal, right? 300 miles, we're going to drag these cannons back here for you. And then when the British see we have these cannons, they'll get right out of town. Now, the thing that gets me about Knox and his journey through Ticonderoga, his trip that goes from Boston um, down in the lower right-hand corner all the way up Lake George, all the way up into upstate New York, and Fort Ticonderoga, the thing that was motivating him was not cannons. His why, if we look back on Senex talk, was freedom. His why was liberty. And so he sets off with his group of individualists, and they get people to go find farmers who have sleds. They talk to people. They get these sleds hooked up. They make these barges. They float them down through Lake George. Just in time, by the way, before Lake George freezes. So they're doing it in the late fall, early winter. They move their cannons down Lake George. They unload them. 
They get these sleds. They get all these oxen from farmers. They start dragging their, their sleds along. And they're actually making some progress. They're about two and a half, three weeks behind. They had said this thing's going to probably take about two weeks. It's already taken far longer than that. And then there comes a moment. They're coming across the Hudson River. And there comes a moment when they're, I don't know, not that far away from the shore. And the ice breaks. Some of these cannons weighed 5,000 pounds, right? The ice breaks, the cannon goes into the water, everybody looks to Henry Knox. Henry Knox is standing, now they actually have ropes tied to the cannons, but Henry Knox is standing there, he's looking, everyone's looking at him, and it would have been so easy. You know, the part that gets me about this is there's almost nothing that I could find written about the specifics of this moment. So Knox is standing there, and so I'm, this is now historical fiction because I can't find anything written, but this is how I imagine it went. So Knox is standing there, he's looking at the cannons that are in the water, and he has a very simple notion. Everything inside of Knox had to be telling him, cut the rope. You're already a couple weeks behind, you've got a bunch of cannon anyway, Keep on moving. Washington needs the cannon. Knox didn't do that. And the reason I believe he didn't do it was because for him, it wasn't about the cannon. For him, it was about the idea. It was about the why. So what happened with Knox is he rounded up a bunch of townspeople. He spent three days in David McCullough's book, 1776, he spends about two sentences on this. But he said he spent three days dragging those cannons out from the bottom of the Hudson River. Now imagine what it must have been like. Imagine if you're standing there. It's freezing. You're sleeping outside. You've been doing this for months. This lake, this river is frozen. And this nutcase is telling you to drag, to try to get the cannon out. Everyone must have been going to him saying, just cut the rope. Let's get out of here. And he said, we're, we're not leaving a cannon behind. Now, I'm a believer that when Knox finally got these cannons out and started dragging them down the road, I'm a believer that not 20 miles later, they hit another similar thing to this. And nobody among Knox's troops ever said, Let's cut the rope. In that moment, he said to them, there is nothing that's going to stop us from getting these cannons across. So as I read the story and started thinking about it more and more, the question that came into mind for me is, what is it about Knox? What did Knox have that I know I would often don't have? What is it that allowed a regular bookseller from Boston to create an unbelievable, extraordinary achievement? Because by the way, Knox got every cannon to Boston. And then in one night, they created this ability to drag all the cannons up to Dor Dorchester Heights. And when the British woke up, and by the way, I don't know that the British who were there had a whole lot of why, but the colonists sure did. And when they woke up and they looked down, there were cannons pointed at their ships from Dorchester Heights. And that day, they packed up and rolled out of Boston Harbor. And by the way, Knox's wife, whose parents were huge loyalists, got on the ship and left with them. And so Knox, this guy, what was it about him? And here's what I would argue. I would argue that it was a combination of three things. That it was a combination of talent, this term grit, which I give credit to Angela Duckworth from the University of Pennsylvania, and then faith, or this notion of why this notion of belief. So for me, talent is this area that what we do so much in our lives, what we often think about is developing knowledge and skill. It's a lot of what school does. It's a lot of what the SAT measures or tries to, et cetera. And what all the research on talent says is it takes 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become a master of anything. But the other thing that inspires me is this notion of grit. 
Angela Duckworth has been doing this research at the University of Pennsylvania on grit. And what she's found is that the truly successful in places like um, West Point, the people that are truly successful and make it through those very challenging environments, it's not based on their GPA. It's not based on how many push-ups they can do. It's based instead on their tenacity, their persistence, their willingness to push through. And that is for termed grit. And the third one for me is faith. It's this notion of believing in something larger than yourself. Henry Knox had faith. His faith was not necessarily religious, but his faith was deep. He believed at that moment that those cannons were going to come up, and it was his faith that helped him stick it through and his grit. Henry Knox went on to be a very successful um, commander. He was the first art secretary of, of the army or the, the military under um, George Washington. And believe it or not, at, at Trenton, when George Washington was crossing the Delaware, and he was sitting, and there's that painting where George Washington's up there like this, it was actually Knox who, behind the scenes, orchestrated that entire event. And so Knox was this presence that I would argue that people often um, didn't know about. So my own experiences, I'm going to jump back for a second, my own experience with this was last year I had the opportunity to run off and, um, and take folio, this idea that you guys have used and was mentioned earlier today, and see if other people wanted to join our little effort to help improve conversations with teachers and so on. And so I helped getting other schools involved with that. And there was a moment I was driving back from Atlanta, Georgia. And I had been on the road for about three weeks, and I was trying to get schools interested. And what hit me was that I was not about the why. I was about the what. I was talking to people about the Folio software and not what it really tries to do. And I changed and began talking about the why. And in that moment, I, was, I really changed my whole perspective. And then things really started to change for the organization. You know, there's this. Um, the water polo team is a great recent example for me, if you will, of raising the cannon, right? When the water polo team won the championship this fall, they weren't supposed to win. Nobody thought they were going to win. They happened to beat Loyola. Bart, Bert told me in the, in the semifinals. Um, we're able to get through it, and an hour later, we're heading into the pool against Calvert Hall for the finals. Quickly, they went down four to one. It would have been so easy at that moment to cut the rope. It would have been so easy to just say, guys, we're not supposed to win this anyway. We should be so happy that we've gotten this far. And instead, what they did was went back into the pool and at the last moment, or almost the last moment, scored the winning goal and won. For me, it's that same cannon moment. The cannon goes through the ice what do you do? Another example that I love is Steve Jobs. So Apple now, by far, now it used to be that it was neck and neck with a few other companies. Now Apple, by far, is the most valuable company in the world. But it all, wasn't always that way. In fact, what you may or may not know is that Steve Jobs founded Apple. He grew Apple into a very successful company but then it started to kind of drift off. They weren't putting out such innovative stuff. Their hardware wasn't great. Their stock price was going down. The board of directors of Apple actually fired Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was fired from the company he created. Imagine that. You create a company, and you end up later on not owning majority shares, and you get fired from your own company. He's fired from it, goes off and starts next. He ends up then starting Pixar. He comes back at one point and comes back and raises the cannon, stays with the mission, stays with the why. And after Apple fired Steve Jobs, they almost went into bankruptcy. It got really bad at Apple. They couldn't get anything done right. But they were able to come back because Steve Jobs brought the why back. But for me, that moment when Steve Jobs got fired, you'd have to think that was like his cannon falling through the ice. Another person who I think of when I think of the canon is Mahatma Gandhi. Believed his why was to not um, protest with violence. Nonviolent protest was his thing. And there were times during the struggle for independence in India 
when it would have been incredibly difficult to not fight back. And there were times when everyone around Gandhi was saying, enough of this nonviolence. We need to go to war. We need to, to fight for our independence. And one of my favorite parts in Gandhi's life is when he said, I will not, there was actually, violence had started to erupt between the British and um, the Indian nationals. And, and Gandhi said, I will not eat again until the violence stops, until everyone stops the violence. And he went on a hunger strike to the point where he almost died. And they would say, they would say, Gandhi, they're, they're almost, almost everyone. There's only like three examples of violence left. I will not eat. And he went on and on to the point where he would have died for that cause. And finally, everyone laid down their arms, and, and India ended up getting its freedom. But it's this notion of the canon, it's going back to Knox, that I want to leave you with. I would argue that over the next 15 years of your life are just incredibly important. There's so many things that are going to come before you. There's so many opportunities, so many decisions. And the, somewhere along the way, your cannon's going to go through the ice. It's going to happen, right? Something's going to happen, and it's going to seem like the cannon went through the ice. And the question is, and it's going to happen to me as well, I'm quite sure that, that the cannon is going to fall through the ice for me at some point in my future. And the question is, how do we respond, right? When we really think back on these leaders, how do we respond when that happens? How do we muster up our grit, find our faith, and also leverage our talent to move forward? Thank you.